<laughs> so I have, the, I have the pleasure of introducing well, Professor John Doyle as today's colloquium speaker, and it's a special pleasure for me because he was my own undergraduate research advisor. Um, so uh, John is a professor in the physics department at Harvard, and he is also co-director of the Harvard, uh, new Harvard Quantum Initiative. He did his undergraduate and graduate degrees at MIT. Um, actually, the undergraduate degree was in electrical engineering, but uh, he uh, then moved on to physics, which we're grateful that he's done. Um, he, in particular, to sort of put some of John's work in context, uh, you know, there are many physicists who would dismiss a, di a diatomic molecule as having one atom too many, um, but John has had, made a career out of being unfazed by molecules. And in particular, um, he's really um, made pioneering contributions to uh, find, finding ways of cooling, trapping, controlling the quantum states of molecules. And he'll be telling you about that today. One of the motivations for taming molecules in this way is that uh, precision molecular spectroscopy is um, a, an approach to searching for physics beyond the standard model. And so you'll hear also about John's role as leader of the ACME collaboration that um, is putting ever more stringent bounds on the electron's electric dipole moment. Uh, John is a fellow of the American Physical Society, um, a Humboldt Fellow, a Fulbright Fellow. I won't list all of his awards, but I'll just um, conclude um, by saying that on a, on a personal note, I also know I can say that he's really an exemplary um, mentor of, of junior scientists, and I think many people would agree with me about that. So with that, let's welcome John as our colloquial speaker. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and to see uh, so many young faces that I've known for so many years. Um, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and uh, I'll be talking today about cold and ultra-cold molecules for quantum science and particle physics. This is really geared uh, as a colloquium. Uh, so if there's an expert in the audience that wants to like, ask some, some penetrating questions, just go right ahead. Um, but I won't be covering a lot of the gory details. So I'm going to take a step back to what I call basic AMO history. AMO is atomic, molecular, and optical physics. I believe that term was coined about 50 years ago now. Uh, and the core of AMO physics is spectroscopy. And what is spectroscopy? Well, spectroscopy is measuring the energy level spacing between two quantum bodies. That's the way we're going to think of it. And AMO is that we have these electromagnetic fields, and we're able to measure that energy level spacing. And this might be the spacing that you learned about uh, for the hydrogen atom, the n equal 1 to n equal 2 spacing. Or it might be the energy of a spin. There's a spin of an electron uh, in a field. And one of the first things that you notice when you start doing spectroscopy is that there's noise out there. There's the environment, and that environment can affect these energy levels. And these external per perturbations uh, change, the, for example, the phase accumulation. You can think of the spin processing in a magnetic field. And if there's an external additional magnetic field, this will process slower or faster. That means it will accumulate phase slower or faster. And that's the kind of measurements that you do. So what that means is that spectroscopy immediately gives you this idea of sensing. And we know what that, that might lead to. For example, the first experiments with NMR, when Norman Ramsey told me the story, he put his head inside the NMR magnet, you know, way back. This is long before the idea of imaging came, came about. Uh, he didn't think of this, right? He didn't know where this basic spectroscopy, he was interested in the properties of the nu uh, nucleus. <coughs> He didn't know that this is what it would end up with, but this is exactly what it ended, ended up happening. So spectroscopy naturally leads to sensing in the way I described. But also spectroscopy leads to control. And uh, here's an extreme example. So this is a picture of an ion. It's a calcium ion. And through the application of uh, all sorts of electromagnetic fields, one can control the position of this ion to, the quant uh, in a, to its quantum <laughs> in a quantum way, meaning that you can put the motional state of the ion into the bottom of, for example, a, um, a simple harmonic oscillator potential that's uh, formed out of these electromagnetic fields, but also you can control the internal state of the ion. That means you can put it in a single electronic state, a single spin state. And 
This leads to the idea of qubits. This plus one other ingredient leads to the idea of qubits. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So that simple spectroscopy, being able to, to interrogate that, uh, that ion, led to now putting the ions together into chains. These ions interact. Each one of these ions can contain some information. For example, spin on the ion. That's not how it works, but just as an example, the spin on the ion can be up or down. That can be a qubit, 0 or a 1. And it's a quantum qubit, so it's that ket. It's not a classical 1 and a classical 0, but in your quantum mechanics class, there's a ket, which is a plus ket and a minus ket. And you can put it into a superposition. And then these ions can interact, and that's kind of the heart of a quantum computer. And so the spectroscopy led to this kind of, uh, this kind of idea. Here's another example. Here's a picture of, uh, of atoms. These are non-neutral atoms. And you can hold atoms inside of an optical. I can't believe I'm sitting here telling you about optical tweezers <laughs> here at Stanford. So yes, you can hold atoms using a trapping force. This is a, a, a picture of a sphere, but just imagine an atom. It's feeling the interaction of uh, this focused laser beam with the electro electric field of the laser beam. Electric field is going like this. The atom is being polarized like this. And the polarization of the atom interacts with the electric field. And if you get things set up right, it will uh, find its way, uh, it form a potential which will draw this atom towards the focus. And this is what we call optical tweezers. And very recently, these optical tweezers have been used to make an atom array. And these atoms are, have this two-level structure. This is ground and excited state. This is this uh, kind of quantum qubit and have been used to form a, kind of, a quantum computer with about 50 qubits. It's even done at uh, Harvard, but also work going on in uh, several other labs. And again, this all came from this idea of, spec of precision spectroscopy. And so if I look at AMO history and I look at, I put along this axis the year, and along this axis the number of quanta that were used in experiments, there was a lot of work to go to get sensitivity higher and higher to work with fewer and fewer quanta until finally we could control one quanta. Right? And then at this time, uh, some people said, well, we're done, we're done, but let's, uh, I'm going to do biophysics instead. <laughs> uh, but some people persevered, and of course you have to keep on changing, you started going back up. Except that the left-hand side is kind of this kind of incoherent ensemble <coughs> of, of atoms or molecules. The right-hand side is the second quantum revolution that you may have heard about, um, and that is that you're putting these individual uh, quanta together in a controlled, coherent way to create a very, a potentially very complex system, a very complex quantum system, including a quantum computer. So that's all with atoms I've been talking about. What about with molecules? Why do research on cold or ultra-cold molecules? And uh, I'll give two answers. One is that the universe is made of molecules. It seems kind of really simple, but there is a lot of physics and science that goes on in the atmosphere, in space, and in biology. And this really has to do with, with molecules. And so the idea of trying to do spectroscopy with molecules the same way that we do spectroscopy, that kind of high precision spectroscopy with atoms, kind of this, this is one just very basic reason to do it. So why cold, though? Why would you want them cold? Well, one reason, I suppose, is that the upper atmosphere is fairly cold. Space is around you know, 4 Kelvin or so. That's one reason to do it. But also, uh, there is a kind of fundamental in the laboratory reason, and that is that the spectroscopy of molecules becomes much, much, much better after you cool them. So molecules, unlike atoms, have these other modes, these rotational and vibrational modes. And so if you're at a given temperature, these modes can get excited. It depends on the temperature. But say if we look at this molecule, anthracene, at a temperature of around uh, 1,000 Kelvin coming out of an oven, the has, it uh, can occupy, it can be excited into about 10 to the 15 different states. What that means is if I have 10 to the 15 anthracene molecules at about 1,000 Kelvin, on average, each one is in a different quantum state. And that means if you're doing spectroscopy driving from one quantum state to another, your signal to noise is very, very, very bad. In addition to that, at high temperatures, these things are moving around, you get Doppler broadening, it's kind of, it's kind of a mess. But if you cool these molecules down to around a Kelvin, then these modes get frozen out, all these vibrational modes get frozen out, and you occupy just a few, you know, maybe a hundred or a thousand rotational modes. 
So your signal to noise shoots through the roof. And you're getting rid of this, this uh, broadening due to the thermal motion. So it turns out we can do this with at least to molecules up to about human hormone size. This is all gas phase. Um, something this is about human hormone size, for those who don't, don't know that. Uh, you can uh, do this by uh, essentially ejecting a hot molecule. It doesn't matter what the temperature of this molecule is at, 1,000 Kelvin, 10,000 Kelvin, and you inject it into a, a small box, say about that big, filled with uh, the right density of helium. That helium is cooled by a solid wall, which is in turn cooled by a refrigerator. So this molecule, with less than a millisecond, will bounce off the helium, come to the temperature of the helium, and there you have it. You have cold molecules. Um, this has been done uh, with uh, in our lab, molecules up to this size, and very recently, at Jilla, uh, this work uh, has, uh, the, this uh, kind of technique has been used on the buckyball. I just will mention here a, a variation of buffer gas cooling. You can do this with a cell that looks like this and do spectroscopy on those molecules, or you can form a beam. And this beam we call a CBGB, cryogenic buffer gas beam. And for those of us who are old enough, you can think of this. This is the talking heads at CPGBs. <laughs> wow. That's it. Stop using it. I'm something else. <laughs> so, uh, so what this can do in optical spectroscopy, here is the optical spectroscopy of uh, tolunitrile, benzonitrile, two kind of relatively small molecules. You can see this fairly broad structure here. And if you were to have a mixture of these two molecules at 300 Kelvin, it would just be this big blob. You really couldn't tell what was there. You couldn't distinguish between the two. But if you cool down to around 4 Kelvin, you get this very narrow lines. And those lines, you know, for atomic physicists, that looks like an atom, right? We've got these very narrow lines. And if you have a cold mixture of these two molecules, you can easily distinguish these lines and figure out that you have uh, these two different molecules. It's kind of like if you have sodium and cesium to connect with somebody. Sodium and cesium in a cell, it's very easy to see that there's sodium and cesium because it only has a few lines, one, uh, one set of lines for sodium and one set of lines for cesium. Here, this is microwave spectroscopy, again, a buffer gas cooled molecules. We made this little cocktail, and this is, a micro, again, microwave spectroscopy, which is spectroscopy uh, uh, that's connected to the rotation of the molecules. And you can see this really is a kind of a fingerprint. It's a very uh, uh, sensitive um, and selective um, uh, method for doing spectroscopy, and we did a number of more kind of chemistry-oriented uh, things in our labs with molecules about this size, including chi a new kind of chiral spectroscopy. Okay, but it does make one thing, and I'll just leave you with this thought um, as we move on, that if we're doing that kind of spectroscopy, that maybe one day, maybe not so long from now, we can have full quantum control over something like that. The way that we work with atoms, Maybe we can work with these things. That means single rotational, single vibrational, single hyperfine state, of course, single electronic state. At least it's an idea. But there's another answer. Cold atoms of, to why cold molecules. Cold atoms are, are proven to do all this incredible physics here. Uh, the best clocks in the world. These are uh, optical lattices, a quantum microscope. Each one is an individual atom. We have quantum fluids. We have quantum computers. We have this cavity, um, uh, Q, cavity QED type stuff, which right here is one of the, the strongest players in. Molecules are quantitative, qualitatively different and more complex. That's one reason to do it. And they have an electric dipole. So if you're trying to make qubits, right, one of the things you're trying, when you try, when you, excuse me, when you try to make a quantum computer, for example, or a quantum simulator, you need to have coupling. Molecules naturally have this very long-lived state, these polarized, electric dipole states that can couple. And so naturally, and that's a number of papers showing how you can make a quantum computer from that. So this is two reasons to, to think about molecules. And uh, on the complexity side, I just want to teach one thing. I was, in every conversation, I want to teach one thing. Here's the one thing I want the students to come away with um, and that you probably don't know. So these are molecules and they can spin around. So this is a symmetric top. This is a uh, triatomic molecule in what's called bending mode. Okay, bending mode is a molecule, there's three atoms, so it can do this. But it also means it can do this, which means it can do this. So it's called vibrational orbital angular momentum. Here is another uh, molecule, um, which is, this is meant to depict that the electron could be orbiting around in a way that creates angular momentum along the internuclear axis. 
These, you can see right away, have angular momentum along the internuclear axis. This, of course, doesn't exist in atoms. <laughs> so here I'm writing down the ket, which describes the angular momentum state of something which has finite orbital angular momentum along the internuclear axis. J is your favorite J, it's the, the angular momentum in the lab frame. M is the projection of that angular momentum in the lab frame. And this, generically written down as omega, is the molecular axis projection. So this is a molecular frame quantum number, not a lab frame quantum number, but it's a perfectly good quantum number. And if I apply the spatial inversion operator to this cat, you can write down this cat, these are the rotation matrices, this changes direction. What that means is that I can create a, uh, uh, two opposite parity states out of linear combinations of those projections. So if you're familiar, the projection, the angular momentum quantum number for a symmetric top is k. So there's a k cat and there's a minus k cat. This plus this is one parity. This minus this is another parity. And if you ignore high order perturbations, these are degenerate. You have two degenerate opposite parity states. You've learned about this, the n equal 2 state in hydrogen, the 2s and the 2p state. Think of them as almost perfectly degenerate. What it means is that you can polarize the hydrogen atom in that state with a very, very small electric field. Okay. Not only that, in this kind of configuration where you have, uh, where you have K or L or omega, you can actually, with a totally uh, low uh, laboratory electric field, uh, for the theorists out there, this is a low electric field. <laughs> The, uh, you can fully polarize, which means that, the, uh, that this state here at this electric field is really the molecule pointed in this direction with an extremely high fidelity. And this is molecule pointed in that direction with extremely high fidelity. There's almost no admixture of this in this, like 10 to the minus 6 up at these high fields. And there's this intermediate state, which, is, which has zero um, dipole moment. It's, it's completely not aligned. You can see this structure doesn't exist in um, doesn't exist in atoms, but it also doesn't exist generically even in a diatomic molecule. Here is a diatomic molecule that doesn't have orbital angular momentum along the internuclear axis, and this is from your, your your quantum mechanics classes. It has this kind of level structure. What the, what's happening is that you start applying an electric field, you start mixing in the low rotational state to the, to the next one, and then at some high high field you start mixing in this one, and then the next one up. Here you can fully polarize because you have two nearly degenerate levels that are very far away from all the other parity state levels. A little bit long-winded, but this is a big deal for atomic physics in the future. Okay. So another way of answering you know, answer two, another answer two, is that cold molecules, because of these kinds of structures, because of the electric dipole, because of the rotational states, there's, been, uh, there's, there's things that you can do uh, that are very, very interesting. Here is a plot uh, uh, I like to put up. It's now almost 10 years old from Peter Zoller, showing if you have dipolar molecules. Here are molecules that also have an electron spin, and you put them on an optical lattice, meaning that you, you use an, a light field to put them in kind of an egg carton configuration. These are separated by about a micron, that you can simulate any spin lattice Hamiltonian. So this is the idea of quantum simulation. There's cooling and collisions, and then there's precision measurement. I want to talk a little bit more about this precision measurement. There are some review papers, including uh, this one, written by these authors, which uh, I point you to, to learn more about, um, uh, about uh, what we call tabletop uh, particle physics, often done with atoms or molecules. So if we go back to this uh, plot, this field here, while it could have been an external magnetic field, or it could be a local environment of, of hydrogen in the brain to do to do um, imaging, but it can also be new, new physics, right? There might be some new particles out there, and that means there's a, your, the, the vacuum has this field in it. In particular, if you have an electron, it's got a very high electric field, you get closer to the electron, the field goes up, it can spontaneously create new particles. Now, we already know this, you can kind of create, uh, you have this kind of cloud of virtual uh, electrons and photons around the electron, this gives you the G minus two effect. But if you have new particles, say new physics particles, uh, those will also show up in the vacuum. But let's, take, let's start at the beginning. Here's the beginning. And then very soon after the beginning, there's the Big Bang. And all sorts of wonderful things happen. Here's neutralization. Here's now. Um, uh, and there are things about the universe that uh, 
we cannot understand microscopically. For example, we know that there's dark matter. We can see that by looking at the gravitational effects of dark matter. You can see light being bent uh, through galaxies. There has to be dark matter there. There's the rotation of, of the rotation speed of the of, 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 um, uh, stars in a, in a galaxy that all points to the fact that there's some kind of dark matter there. And of course, there's the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. This universe is made of matter. And if you take some very, very simple assumptions about the Big Bang, there'd be no reason very early in the Big Bang where matter would be uh, preferred over antimatter, yet somehow or other, during the expansion of the universe, matter was preferred. And neither of these mysteries is explained by the standard model. So here's the standard model in cartoon form. But the standard model describes all lab-based particle experiments, everything that we've seen. It does not answer dark matter and uh, the dark matter question, the matter antimatter asymmetry question, and then there's a hierarchy problem, which is a, it's a theoretical issue, but a very important one. A possible solution is to add these funny-looking particles, so that's a new rule book. And one of the favorite examples of this is what's called supersymmetry, and I'll be talking about some of these results in terms of supersymmetry. It's a way of a kind of that's a bit quantifying uh, some of our results. So people look for these new particles, uh, particles, these new particles, then one could be a dark matter particle. These particles generically contain CP violation, and that kind of CP violation is necessary. Sorry, I'll take that back. Uh, generally thought that CP violation is necessary to describe the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. And you can try to create them directly through these kinds of experiments. But it's an amazing fact, which I've already alluded to, that any of these new particles are right here, right now. They're inside of you. And as creepy as that might be, it's the truth. Um, and here is the way that we can write that down. Here is a Feynman diagram. There's an electron, and here's this new particle x. So this is a single loop diagram. There's some coupling constant here, and then there's, again, generically this uh, phase factor here. Uh, here's the experimentalist description. You can think of the electron as being like a little antenna picking up the existence of these new particles. So uh, these new particles with uh, this CP violating phase phi here uh, generically create what's called the electric dipole moment of the electron. So you know that the electron has a magnetic dipole moment, and it could have an electric dipole moment. And that electric dipole moment is CP violating inherently, you can think about that. Um, and it would come from this existence of these new particles. You can make an estimate of uh, what the size of the electric dipole moment of the electron would be for a given mass of, a, of one of these uh, proposed particles. I like this way of doing this. is really kind of this back of the envelope kind of AMO way of doing it. What you're doing is you're using the fact that you know the magnetic moment of the electron, and then you're comparing that, uh, the mass of the electron, to whatever the mass of this new proposed particle is. And here's a CP violating phase. Natural assumption is that that phase is, is one. So now I'm going to talk about the ACME experiment. Um, this hopefully you've seen. In the ACME experiment, we use lots of tricks. All of these tricks uh, are there to suppress systematic errors. And this is my one systematic error slide <laughs> in that uh, it would take an entire hour to talk about all the systematics. So those of you who are precision people know I'm not going to talk about systematics, but of course I'm happy to discuss that in some other way. Uh, so the ACME uh, uh, electron EDM experiment is, there's three PIs, uh, Dave DeMille from Yale, myself, and Jerry Gabriels, who's now at Northwestern. We use this molecule, it's a very special molecule. It does have orbital angular momentum along the internuclear axis. It's one of the few molecules where this comes from the electron orbiting around. The electric field in here is 10 to the 10 volts per centimeter. Uh, this is a large electric field. Uh, you cannot create in the lab. But the electron, the valence electron that's flying around here can feel that. Why is that important? Well, we're going to be looking for an electric dipole moment of the electron, and so we want to see an energy shift due to that existence of that electric dipole moment. I should say that the standard model predicts an electric dipole moment that I will never see. The standard model prediction for the electric dipole moment is very, very, very small. So this is a zero background experiment. We're never going to, if we see an electric dipole moment, it definitely comes from new physics. And so we can polarize this molecule very easily by putting it into an electric field of about 10 volts per centimeter. So here, this set of states here, what I call n tilde, is the quantum number. Uh, 
this uh, internal quantum number in, the, in this notation. The molecule is pointing this way, and you can see there's two uh, states for the electron spin pointing up and uh, pointing down. Because of these two states, there'll be a shift due to the presence of the electric dipole moment interacting with this high electric field inside the molecule, and that's depicted by this green line here. The red line is that we also, in this experiment, apply a magnetic field, and that's so that we can do the following. We can apply a magnetic field, we tip the spin over, it processes around, and we measure the phase accumulation. Then what we do is we do the exact same experiment except we turn the molecule around, and then we measure that phase, and if there is an electric dipole moment of the electron, that phase accumulation will be slightly different because the, this uh, electron electric dipole moment will be interacting with the high electric field. That's the core of it. We do a kind of a Ramsey-Robbie um, experiment. Here's a cold molecular beam, the CBGB that I was talking about. Uh, here we uh, use slightly a slightly warmer CBGB than we do in the experiments I'll talk about later. This is a neon-based experiment. We ablate uh, THO2 to create THO. It gets cooled down by this uh, neon gas. It comes out in a beam, kind of ignore all this stuff. Right around here, what we do is we use lasers to optically pump, excuse me. In the first experiment, we use lasers to optically pump to get the spin to flip over. As it travels from here to here, it will process around, and then we use optical pumping once again to measure the spin procession. And this is a you know, straight up you know, old school uh, kind of uh, beam uh, precession experiment. Um, here is, uh, so that, that was ACME 1. Here's a picture of ACME 2, our latest experiment uh, for scale. Um, I don't know. It's kind of, it's kind of a. Look, your talk has both of the moves for this animal. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's fine. Yeah, everything's fine. So yeah, this is about this is the size of our apparatus. Okay, uh, so this is this is the molecular beam source. It's actually cryogenic. It's a little bit tricky, but we know how to do it. And then uh, this interaction region is here. These shields are electromagnetic shields to suppress uh, external magnetic field uh, variations. Uh, right, I just told you that. And the, the coherence time for those experts in the audience that the time the molecules fly from here to here. Prepare the spin here, measure it here, it's about one millisecond. That's the coherence time. So long story short, uh, we did uh, this experiment uh, recently, um, published at the end of last year. We have a new limit on the electron EDM that was 10 times better than our previous limit, which was also 10 times better than the limit before that. And so the new uh, re uh, number is that the electron, that moment of the electron is less than 10 to the minus 29 e centimeters. It's electron charge times centimeters. Oh yeah, these are all the systematic errors that we cared about. Okay, this was the, the team that, uh, that did the work, um, and this includes um, many people, including uh, Nick Hustler, who is now at Caltech, I'll mention a little bit uh, later. Uh, right, so how do we interpret this result? Well, you need theory, and this is uh, how you would interpret the result in terms of supersymmetry. Here's uh, supersymmetry predicts a bunch of superpartners, including the stop particle we slept on. Here's the mass. And then assuming uh, order uh, unity, Susie phases in uh, two loop. Here's a, a typical two loop. This is from calculation by Matt Reese. Um, that we now uh, put the, uh, the bound on uh, stop for order of unity, uh, Susie phase to be greater than 5 TeV, and for the slept on uh, greater than 30 TeV. So we're making, uh, uh, oh, I should also mention there's a nuclear uh, EDM experiments that also play a role. Um, they, there's also only a limit, and no one's seen a nuclear EDM or the EDM of any fundamental particle. Um, so this is another way of looking at it. Here's uh, the limits put on the EDM. Uh, here's the value of the limit. Here's time in this direction. So in 2014, here was the ACME, uh, our ACME result. Uh, the previous best result was over here. 2010 by Imperial, and we're basically uh, ruling out theories as one goes further and further. Um, and you, know, you can pick your favorite theory, but this kind of naive Susie um, really has been completely ruled out, unless for some reason the CP violating phase is suppressed to a very, very high degree, and now theorists are starting to think about that too. 
Comparison with accelerators, uh, people have often asked this, so now I've made this plot. So here is the, uh, the, the, uh, the um, excuse me, this is the uh, mass reach uh, in the diamonds, this is the actual uh, center of mass energy in the squares, here's LHC, this is the LHC maximum ma uh, mass reach. Um, the direct creation of new particles at accelerators is not intrinsically dependent on uh, CP violation. And here is the ACME2 result. Here's the stop value. Here again for order of unity CP phase. And here is uh, the one loop a selectron result um, up here. So how do we improve this measurement? Um, okay, it might be a vast wasteland of physics between here and the Planck scale. That's possible. But let's keep on looking. Um, and so that's a reasonable thing to do, I think. So uh, how do you improve uh, looking for the EDM? Well, one thing you can do is increase the effective electric field. That you can't really do very much more. The molecule, uh, the, the molecule we picked has really got the highest effective electric field. You might get something different by order of unity. You can always count more, uh, count more molecules, and that's essentially what we do when we improve these experiments, uh, for acne at least. The other thing you can improve is coherence time. Okay. Uh, I will very quickly mention that this is in the uh, standard quantum limit. Uh, this right here is a hotbed of uh, the idea that you can spin squeeze. I'm going to skip this uh, due to time. But the basic idea is you can do quantum squeezing to improve this measurement. And this is a, a slide I borrowed uh, from Monica and I show once in a while. There's an entire area uh, getting extremely exciting about uh, how you might be able to use uh, uh, these kinds of quantum effects to do uh, precision measurements better. And of course, there's this, this paper by uh, Mark Kasovich, a Nature 2016 paper, which indicates that these kinds of uh, squeezing by using entanglement, you can get maybe a factor of 10 sensitivity better. And a factor of 10 sensitivity is a pretty big deal. And I think this will eventually be applied to NEM experiments. I don't know how soon that will happen, simply because uh, the systematic effects are not fully understood and people are scared. Fear. Fear drives precision measurement. Um, but the, with pioneers uh, uh, like Monica and Mark, um, I think we might get convinced uh, at some point. So we want long coherence time. That would be great. Remember, we only have a millisecond. And those who are doing the schooling in the audience know that you should be able to hold um, atoms for a lot longer than that, and people get coherence times in, in atomic clocks that are you know, 10 seconds or more. So there's two approaches that have been used for EDM. One is using an ion trap. This is Eric Cornell and Jeunier's uh, experiment at Gilla. It uses the same uh, molecule, the same kind of structure that we have. And here you hold them as ions in an ion trap. You can hold them for a very long time, and their, their coherence time is up to about three seconds now. You can also laser cool atoms to such a low temperature that you can hold them in effectively optical tweezers. Remember those? We call that an ODT, optical dipole trap, that you can then load, in this case it was radium atoms doing a nuclear EDM measurement, load them into a laser beam, into this laser beam, and then hold them there uh, for 10 seconds or longer and get this very long coherence time. So there's going back to uh, to cold molecules, a lot of motivation to, to work with cold molecules. I've told you about uh, this motivation, <clears throat> mentioned a little bit about this. I'll just point out that there's a lot of science, and there's a number of papers out there that if you're interested in quantum simulation, quantum com computation, um, you should take a look at it with molecules. This is this uh, paper in, in particular, but those of, in the audience who are uh, interested in, in, in uh, condensed matter physics, um, and, and this kind of thing, uh, you can see that depending on the kinds of molecules and the kinds of systems, that they're, because of the internal structure, this electric dipole plus the internal structure, they can play a major role in all of these, uh, these areas. It's a very, very, uh, very, very active field, including theoretically. So, with all this motivation, why isn't everybody working with molecules? They are. <laughs> when I started, they, they weren't. That was a long time ago. But now this is just a partial list of, of, of people working with one particular way of making molecules is associate two atoms into a molecule. You laser cool atoms, which is a very now standard technique. You laser cool them to, low, to very low temperature, say micro Kelvin, and then you can knit them together, bind them together using laser light. 
Uh, that's one way of doing it. Uh, this middle one I'm skipping. This is only done in my lab and I don't do it anymore. Another way you can uh, make cold molecules is somehow or other, when you create them chemically, you get them out of a bottle or you create them through ablation or some other way, and then you slow them down mechanically and then maybe use a few other tricks to get them cold. What I'll be talking about is laser cooling. Laser cooling of direct laser cooling of molecules. And you already have you have a bound molecule and you want to laser cool it and bring it down to micro Kelvin temperatures. You know, I'll explain what MOR is a little bit later. So let me tell you a little bit about laser cooling. Again, I feel funny standing here talking about laser cooling. So that laser cooling, let's ignore this over here for a second. Laser cooling, the idea is you have a beam of say atoms. Uh, this beam of uh, these atoms have very discrete energy levels. You can cause the atom to, uh, get, uh, to absorb a photon from the laser beam by tuning the laser frequency to the energy between these two uh, levels. When it absorbs a photon, it gets a little momentum kick. With some creativity, you can use the, the, the lasers in a way that will actually slow a beam of atoms. So here's a, uh, atoms moving this way, you have the laser pointing this way, and you scatter many, many photons and you can actually bring this atom to near rest. And so the, what you're doing is you're cycling, you're absorbing the photon, and then you're emitting it spontaneously, you're absorbing and emitting it. And that's exactly what you do. You send the laser beam this way, you send the atoms that way, and you do this, uh, and it works. And it's been done now for about 30 years. Typically for, for um, atoms, there's an oven. Uh, you have some kind of uh, carefully engineered uh, laser beam. And then what you do, and once you've got them slow enough, you can actually use a special kind of laser cooling called the magneto-optical trap to cool them down to uh, below a millikelvin and hold them in free space. And then you can use other tricks to get them even colder, down to a microkelvin or below. You key, and the key point is you need to excite and de-excite about 10,000 times. You need to cycle this photon about, excuse me, you need to cycle this atom about uh, 10,000 times in order to bring it to rest coming out of the oven. So that's the key figure of merit. You need to scatter 10,000 photons because each photon only gives a little bit of a kick to the um, atom. And that's usually okay for atoms. And so again, there's a huge amount of work done uh, with atoms uh, uh, using this uh, laser cooling. So direct laser cooling of molecules, our approach is to take the CBGB. Why CBGB? Because first of all, the molecules are coming out, the, uh, are only in a few rotational states. We're going to end up wanting to work with a single rotational state to do laser cooling. And also they're coming out very slow with a very high intensity. CBGB is about a factor of 10,000 times brighter molecular source for radicals than any other molecular source. And so on this kind of plot, here's the temperature of a CBGB. This is what's called this is a buffer gas cooling blob here. Here's the density within the buffer gas cooling cell. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to move in this direction, go to higher densities and go to lower temperatures. And we're going to try to do it using laser cooling. Eventually, we want to be able to get up here where you have temperatures and densities to see quantum degeneracy. So here's the picture. You have a CBGB, you have the laser. We want to do this, we want to do that, and we want to do that. But we have to cycle this thing 10,000 times. And so you have a problem. This uh, you'll see is a kind of a set of slides which are highlights of laser cooling uh, and also issues with laser cooling through to, uh, 2016. In, in 2014, so people thought, oh, that's too hard because typically you can't just, if you shine a laser at a molecule, what happens? It goes into the, it gets excited. That worked once. But then when it de-excites, it goes into some other state that you started with, and now the laser is no longer on residence. And so DeRosa pointed out, yeah, that's true almost all the time, but there are some molecules that have what are called diagonal Frank Condon factors. So if we start at this ground state, the ground vibrational state, the ground electronic state, and excite up here, most of the time, say 90, 98% of the time, it will come right back down here, and now the laser can cycle. Once in a while, it will go to this level, but then I get another laser, I get a second laser to push it back into this state, and now it cycles another 98 times or whatever, and then, this, and then, you, and then once in a while, it will go to this state, so you add another laser. So for these kinds of molecules, you can continue to scatter photons up to tens of thousands of photons with a few repumping lasers. So that was okay for these vibrational states, but remember this state, this rotational state? You also have to close that rotational state. So you can go into an excited rotational state, 
you want to make sure it comes down. I don't have the time to talk about it, but Ye pointed out that there was a way of closing the rotational state. After that, uh, then uh, people thought, ah, maybe we should try this, and Dave DeMille was the first to accomplish uh, 1D laser cooling of a diatomic molecule, strontium fluoride. This is, a this is the class of molecules which has this bonding structure which leads to this di diagonal prank condom factor. And there was a series of, of improvements, uh, and I think the, uh, right there in 2016, um, these were all loaded from the CBGB. Um, uh, Dave DeMille had the first uh, loading of a 3D uh, MOT. This again was for strontium fluoride. In 2016, we did laser cooling of molecule Z, and I'll tell you what molecule Z is later. Let's try to build up the tension. So uh, we were at the same time working on, this is not molecule Z, on calcium fluoride. Calcium fluoride has this diagonal Frank condom factors. I figured I should put this up for those people who are really atomic physicists here. This is what a bubble diagram looks like for a molecule. The ground electronic state, two excited uh, electronic states. Here are the, um, here are the uh, vibrational excitations. You can see all these, uh, these laser frequencies for calcium fluoride are in the visible. Um, so you can... Uh, you can buy lasers that produce lots of laser light at these wavelengths, including dye lasers. Uh, and it takes about 10 to the 4 photons to stop this molecule coming out of the CBG. If it were coming out of the oven, you could forget this. It would be just way too hard. Atoms, are, atoms uh, you have much higher cycling uh, rates than uh, molecules. So uh, then in 2017, after a lot of work, we were able to do this. We were able to make a mod of calcium fluoride. And also at the same time, uh, at, uh, or near, uh, almost simultaneously uh, with the work at Imperial College, uh, they were also working on calcium fluoride. This was in 2017. This is what it looks like. Here's a CBGB cell. Here's the MOT chamber. Here's the slowing laser. And then we have these orange lasers are the MOT beams to cool. Uh, this was done in collaboration with uh, Jun Ye. Uh, he supplied uh, the RF coil technology. It turns out you can't even use a regular MOT coils, regular DC MOT coils. These need to actually be oscillating at many megahertz in order for this rotational mixing to, to work. And then uh, we supplied Jun with the CBGB uh, technology. I'll mention a little bit more about this later. I'm going to skip that. So where are we, um, uh, at least in 2018? Uh, what we, uh, this is kind of the state of uh, direct laser cooling of molecules. Uh, we, uh, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that at this time we had uh, temperatures around 5 microkelvin. This was uh, using uh, what's called lambda enhanced cooling. For us old people, this is what we used to call VSCPT. It's now called lambda enhanced cooling. Don't ask me why. And uh, we were able to load um, the molecules into an optical dipole trap. Um, and uh, yeah. Also, uh, in 2018, all of these molecules are this uh, metal uh, fluoride structure. Um, Jun Ye was working on this uh, yttrium oxide for, uh, for, for specific reasons, and he was able to get the, the, the MOT to work also in uh, 2018. And this, again, with, this is a collaboration uh, with myself, um, as I mentioned before. Okay, kind of rushed through that. There was a lot. Uh, that's a separate talk all by itself, what I just, in the last about five or, or six slides. But I wanted to get to this, which is um, more recent work. This just, uh, we just put this up on the archive last week. And so, 2019, we're kind of headed towards this idea of having these molecules in an optical tweezer array to do uh, quantum uh, simulation and computation, and potentially uh, in this kind of idea of putting them in an optical lattice. So we started working on this, and the idea is, uh, here's the MOT region, these are these RF coils, these are the MOT coils, and we have uh, three kinds of lasers, beams going in here. One kind of laser beams are not, laser, one kind of laser light is not shown, that's the cooling light. So there's cooling light coming through here, okay, it's not shown, but this is how we do, uh, for the experts in the audience, we do lambda enhanced uh, uh, cooling. So we have uh, molecules in the MOT. We apply lambda enhanced cooling. We apply this beam here. See this beam here? This is a 1064 nanometer. That's the wavelength of a light. We focus it into this region. And we apply the cooling. The molecules fall into the optical potential and are actually cooled as they're falling. That allows us to trap into this optical potential. 
Then what we do is we apply another set of tweezers where we focus uh, multiple light beams down to very small points, something on the order of two microns. And the molecules that were in the ODT, we apply, VS, the, we apply lambda enhanced cooling, and then they fall into these optical tweezer potentials. That's the idea. To give you a sense of scale, here's the, the original Mach cloud. This is the size of the, the cloud of cold atoms. <coughs> We cool into this ODT, and then we apply these are with 780 nanometer light uh, tweezers, about two microns in diameter. Uh, and it worked. So again, this is a separate talk. The, for experts in the audience, we are able to measure collisional blockade. These are absolutely single molecules, not two. No, zero here, zero here, a single shot image. There's one, one, one. And this is a multi-shot average image. This is the probability of loading these tweezers. Uh, here's the phase space density. This is uh, kind of a figure of merit for many experiments. We start down here in the uh, MOT uh, with this phase space. Um, and then through each one of these steps, we're increasing phase space. And so we're now uh, at the point where we're seeing uh, collisions, of course, collision with blockade, but we also have seen uh, collisions in the dark. This is the first time we've seen collisions with uh, laser cooled molecules. I don't have time to discuss all that, but again, you can go to this, uh, this uh, preprint that uh, went up last week. But there are motivations. Ah, uh, we're, not, we're not done. There are motivations for doing larger molecules. I've mentioned a, a, a bit about that. Uh, there are a number of papers showing how if you have molecules, say symmetric top molecules, you can use some of the properties that I've already mentioned to uh, do powerful quantum simulation. There's, of course, cold chemistry. Um, and then I've already mentioned about how you can look for beyond the standard model physics using molecules. But we'll get back to this right at the end. So while we were doing a separate experiment on uh, SROH, strontium oxygen hydrogen, and as we were doing that experiment, it was a different approach to, 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 lay, to, um, to loading molecules into a magnetic trap, we realized the following. We realized this idea of uh, of, of the metal fluorine combination producing diagonal Frank Condon factors could move over to metal pseudofluoride. What's a pseudofluoride? It's any group that looks like a fluorine chemically. What do I mean by that? Remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to optically cycle the, the, uh, the molecule. And here, if we have a metal atom and a fluorine atom, the reason we can optically cycle is because if you look at the electron cloud in the ground electronic state and the excited electronic state, it's over here. It's over here, almost to the right of the metal atom. And it's really, very little of that cloud is over here on the fluorine atom. That's what gives this, uh, this structure, uh, uh, this what makes the structure have a very diagonal Frank Condon. Uh, why the Frank Conner factors are very diagonal. But we can replace this fluorine atom with this, which is a pseudofluoride. So here's calcium, and here's a methyl group, and here again the electron cloud excited in ground state is way over here next to the calcium. So that's saying that it doesn't really matter what's over here. Here we're going to laser cool by exciting and de-exciting over here, and we can put it wherever we want. This was our idea. And yet, it sounds you know, first thing, you know, especially to me, you know, I grew up as a graduate student working on atomic hydrogen, 1s to 2s. That's, that's the simplest pop, you know, this looks really complicated. So what? Let's try it. And this is team molecule Z. So this is molecule Z, which is strontium monohydroxide. And so we figured out uh, to try to laser cool strontium monohydroxide. This, we use a particular kind of laser cooling called Sisyphus laser cooling. You have to scatter a large number of photons in Sisyphus laser cooling just like any other, but Sisyphus laser cooling is particularly powerful, um, especially in 1D. So here we have a beam of molecules going this way. We have a laser beam retroreflected here. And uh, essentially what you do is you arrange things so that the molecule is always riding up an optical potential hill. Um, it's a fairly standard uh, technique for, for atoms. So here's a picture of the molecular beam. The molecular beam is traveling in this direction. The laser beam is traveling in this direction. So here's uh, where they intersect with no cooling. You get the 
the, this profile. And if you tune the uh, lasers correctly to get cooling, you get this profile. That is that the molecules are compressed in this direction. They were about 50 millikelvin in 1D, and here they're about 700 microkelvin. And what this showed is that you could laser cool a polyatomic molecule. That's what we showed, and that you can read about. But it also, at the same time, we wrote a theory paper which was saying, well, look, you can, this is generalizable to much larger molecules. Here's a calcium, and here's a pseudofluoride here, a particular kind of molecules, M-O-R, metal oxygen radical. So you put this radical here, and you can attach what you want to it, including potentially a carbon species. Um, that kind of led to even more ideas. Well, here you can make a little chain. Here's your optical uh, cycling center here. Um, that's the metal atom, and you can cycle many, many photons. It's kind of odd. This, we were just talking about this with your you know, crystals. This, you cannot put in water. It won't work anymore. <laughs> but uh, still, this idea that you can have maybe two optical cycling centers that can be super radiant, um, perhaps. You can uh, add, put this on a chain, attach it to a surface. You can have these interact. The entire idea, also in the ion, and ionic phase, and so this is kind of something to explore. Great. Excellent. So let me tell you about a future work that's underway uh, in my labs. Part of the idea of this colloquium is kind of give you a view of kind of how I, you know, what is going on in my labs, but also kind of how I view it. Well, first of all, we've got absolutely foolproof plans, as always, for a future ACME experiment. Uh, that is depicted here. Here's again this uh, kind of theories and these exclusions that we've been doing. And uh, uh, roughly four years from now, we're, we're building a new, new version of this experiment. Um, we hope to be uh, around here intersecting in some fairly interesting new theory space. Uh, second thing we're doing is a new EDM experiment, which uh, will produce a result later. That's a brand new experiment. We started with an empty lab about uh, six months ago, a little bit longer, eight months ago. This is in collaboration with Nick Hutzler at Caltech, who started uh, about a year or so ago. Uh, Nick Hutzler and Ivan Kozirev uh, wrote a paper in 2017 showing that this kind of molecule might be ideal for doing the next generation EDM experiment. Why? You all know why now. Because you can laser cool it, that means you can get it cold enough to put into an optical lattice or an optical dipole trap it means you have uh, long coherence times up to around 10 seconds. It's a heavy molecule which is necessary for being EDM sensitive and it's got the L doubling. L is the quantum number for orbital angular pro projection along the internuclear axis for this bending mode that I was talking about before. So it has all of the features, and we can make large numbers of it, it has all of the features that you want for this next generation EDM experiment. And that would be pushing um, now into this kind of uh, theory space. And we estimate in about seven years. I should be, uh, not being defensive, but I want to be clear. When we made predictions for ACME 1 and ACME 2, the predictions we made, we hit. And the prediction we made, it was based on statistical sensitivity for one day of running. So all of the quotes that I bring up here is statistical sensitivity for one day of running not for running for a year. Turns out that that's how all the EDM experiments work because you spend all the rest of the time looking for systematics. So what would that look like? Uh, in the future, here's the poly EDM um, shown, uh, shown here. Again, this is uh, the two loop. I didn't write it. Oh yeah, this is a two loop result. So this would be for the stop uh, particle. And you may be wondering, gee, that looks awfully optimistic, but this is totally generic in AML. You see these plots, and they go along like this, and they have a kink, and they go like this. If I put a clock plot down here, you'd see the same thing as a function of time. And that's because when you have a new technology come in, you get this change in the slope. And so this, I think, is a, a very realistic uh, thing to see in the future. Uh, there's, I do want to point out this uh, paper, if you haven't seen it and you're interested in this, Interpreting the electric, uh, Electron EDM Constraint uh, by Matt Rees, who's a, a wonderful theorist um, at Harvard, um, and I'll just leave it at that for, for those who are interested. Uh, this is another plot from Matt Rees, trying to put it in terms of, uh, of other searches, LHC searches, and, um, well, 
This is also LHC, this flavor violation. Uh, here is what EDMs are kind of doing now. This is the dark blue, and this is where we're projecting uh, using existing quantum tools without using the quantum squeezing that I was talking about before. So if we get quantum squeezing to work, this would be even better. The point is, is that he invented a new world called geronicity. These are more generic uh, types of, the uh, of, of theories that you're testing. So this is less generic as you go to the right. EDMs, if, if for, them, for an EDM to appear, they have to have some kind of CP violation. If you're going to create a particle at LHC, you don't need CP violation, so the LHC is more generic than the EDM. Um, but it kind of gives you a feel, uh, you know, trying to put these things on, on one plot is always difficult, but this kind of gives you a feel for the power of EDMs. Another thing we're doing is, uh, now we have uh, molecules and tweezers, we're going to start looking for dipole coupling to try to create this kind of uh, quantum computer. And there's a paper by a company, this one, this uh, chemical science paper showing uh, you can get very, very high uh, fidelities, 99.99, pretty reasonable, uh, pretty reasonably thorough paper, I believe, uh, for doing a dipolar exchange. Uh, here's one last plot. There's complexity versus number of atoms. What we're doing here is we're trying to create, as I kind of alluded to, uh, more and more complex systems that are fully controllable. So now what we're going to have these, these more complex quantum objects, these molecules, and we're starting to put we're, the plan to put those together to create even more complex quantum systems that still have the kind of control we have over atoms in AMO systems. Uh, so uh, there's a few other things that we're doing in, in the lab, um, and I'll just leave with that. Thank you. Do I understand correctly that the chief advantage to looking at a molecule right now is the bigger electric field in it? Yes. It's slightly more complicated, but that's 90% of it. The, really what it is is that with the molecule, you can fully polarize it in the lab frame. And therefore, the electric field that the electron feels inside the molecule is 100%. For an atom, let's say a radium atom, if I apply a laboratory field on, the opposite parity states are so far away from each other, you only slightly polarize the, the atom. Okay, so I have one more question. Sure. It has to do with the rotational levels, and uh, which I was a little lost in your talk. So when the molecule gets bigger, the uh, rotational levels become increasingly problematic. Because they're, you know, it's big at moment of inertia, so they're low. And uh, uh, I think you're freezing those out from the other. I mean, that was my understanding of how. Yes. So, the, so the laser is for translation degrees of freedom. Yeah. It's a, I saw some questions. Let me get. Let me get. Let me, yeah, yeah, this, yeah, is yeah. this is something I don't do good enough job at, and I, I, I've been meaning to try to. So this is what's going on. They come out of the CPGB. There's a few rotational states that are excited. We take the population from only one of those rotational states, and we throw out the other population. So say if you were occupying n equal 1, n equal 2, and n equal 3, we ignore n equal 2 and n equal 3. We only operate on the n equal 1 molecules. They're coming out of the oven, and then we start laser cooling, and we always keep them in a single quantum state. So that's the way to think of it. All of the vibration states are cooled in the CBG. Okay. Gotcha. So that's clarified. Now here's the question. Yeah. When the molecule gets bigger, it gets harder and harder to do because you have to throw out more and more. That's right. Okay. So where are you gonna where are you gonna get stuck? <laughs> the answer is I don't know, but the molecules that I put up, which are already a challenge, it's really not an issue. You get a little order of unity less molecules, or more precisely, get a little bit order of unity fewer molecules in a single quantum state, but it's plenty enough to do the experiments that we want. As we get bigger and bigger, then you're absolutely right. What's going to happen is, it's say, in the case you've got a protein, right? It just, I'm never going to be a laser cooled protein. So let's say you have a protein, you, that comes out of a CBG, assuming that that will come out of a CBG, then uh, there'll, be, there'll be a huge number of states still excited, 
and then the population in any given state will be very low and you've got a problem. And I don't know how that will be resolved if you ever get there. Is there any but there's so much physics to do with these small molecules. That, yeah. It's just like, all right, so my last, one, one, look, one more. So is there any, is there any sense to putting another, putting a, another gas in the, another, another thing in the trap that has a big heat capacity and, and getting rid of the, no, excuse me, I take this question back. This is an offline question. Okay, we'll save that for offline. Are there other questions? Yeah. In the beginning, you mentioned parallel spectroscopy. Yeah, so we did it. We figured out how um, to use microwave spectroscopy to, um, to, to determine the chirality of the species that you're studying. That's, that's the short answer. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it has the same, the, the level of signal is the same as you have for just regular two-level spectroscopy. And if you give me one minute, I can try to describe it. Are we ready? You know, okay. So um, if I take an asymmetric top, you know, some random shaped thing like that computer that's open, and I can spin that asymmetric top around the principal moments of inertia. So if I try to torque it around Say there's A, B, and C. We're going to call those are the three axes. So if I rotate it around A, it'll spin around A. If I torque it around B, it'll spin around B. If I torque it around C, it'll spin around C. Right? What if I simultaneously torque it around A and C? Then you know gyroscopic motion. It will. It has to rotate around B. Are we okay with that? So rotational spectroscopy is where you're applying a microwave field to cause the molecule to rotate. Right? So now it means that if I apply uh, a torque, a, a torque using a microwave field around A and C simultaneously, then the molecule will be rotating around B. Now think about chirality. Here's my hands, right? So what's the difference between this hand and this hand? So this is a mirror image of that, right? Here's A, B, and C. So here's A, B, Oh, sorry, I'll do this. A, C is my pointing finger, and here's B. That means if I, if I apply A and C, then I'm getting an oscillation in B. That's my middle finger, sorry. <laughs> my middle finger. But you notice because the different handedness, B is oscillating that way, while on the, 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 the other chirality, it's oscillating the other direction. So it turns out that if you measure the phase of B, you can exactly determine the chirality of the molecule. So it's warm molecules, cold molecules? It's easier, for the reasons I mentioned, for cold molecules, because your signal is much higher. But it, it, can, it can be done with, there's nothing about the temperature, it's just, uh, just spectroscopy. So the, the problem of chiral detection in microwaves is solved. Are there questions? I have one, so you said you wouldn't talk about systematics, but um, yes. co comparing um, actually the you know, beam of diatomic molecules with this proposal for a lattice of polyatomic molecules, I can imagine there might be big differences in terms. So could you comment a little bit on advantages and disadvantages in terms of dealing with systematics? Yeah, uh, so the answer is in ACME 1 and ACME 2, we spent six months diagnosing, in both experiments, six months diagnosing a systematic error that we had no previous uh, knowledge of. And I expect all EDM experiments to be like that. So the, the only comparison I can give, because of that, the only comparison I can give is uh, statistical sensitivity, and that's it. That being said, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to sort out the systematics, given this one day statistical sensitivity I've been quoting. But it may also be that when you get these molecules in the trap, you'll find a systematic error that you just will not be able to solve. And we'll just have to see. So in your picture of the YBOH uh, experiment, it looks to be in the optical 
that is off your trap. Yeah. Um, do you need to worry about like the energy shift to the trapping light? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do. As, you know, it's got a, it, this molecule is going to have a tensor shift. So you know, you, right? So you hope that. Uh, if I were to be up, let me just be super optimistic. So there's a tensor light shift. So what? What you're doing is in the in the EDM experiment with this L doubling, you're doing the experiment, there's an electron inside the molecule. So you're doing the experiment with the molecule pointed this way, and okay, you've got this, this shift. But then what you do is you just turn the molecule around like this. And then do the experiment again. And that's how you're actually figuring out what the EDM contribution is. And then you're saying, well, wait a second. If that's the case, and I don't care what the shift is, what you have to look at is higher order problems. Things like imperfections of the magnetic field gradient with the shift. You have multiple, and that's how all of our systematics end up being, is that we have multiple things that, con that together contribute. But to zero order, because you sw can switch the molecule back and forth using this L doubling, you're going you're, you're to be insensitive to the shifts. So there's the optimistic, and then there's the reality. Is there going to be some other stray field which is going to couple into the polarization, which is going to couple in to you know somebody walking around the lab or something? Yeah. Any last burning question? Otherwise, we'll let's thank John one more time.